Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government, and I think I've got a guest today you're going to enjoy. Wenge Newton, he goes by Newt, Yes. Florida Legislature, District 60, or 70, 70 excuse me, District yes. 70. Newt, where is District 70? So those of my people who don't know where that is will have some idea. Well, District 70 encompasses Pinellas County, uh, Hillsborough, Manatee, Sarasota. Uh, it's, it goes from Round Lake in downtown St. Pete, uh, over 275 Skyway Bridge, <laughs> up about 10 minutes up uh, 75, and over the horizon is Ruskin. It comes back down through Ruskin, through Rabonia, through Palmetto, through Bradenton, which is Manatee County, and then all the way down to uh, Fruitville Road between 301 and 41 uh, to Newtown area, and that's a nice contiguous <laughs> district. And if the fish can vote, I'll be here forever. <laughs> It reminds me of the, there was a 5K run through one of the districts right. uh, not too long ago, and it, it took like six hours to get because they had to go down telephone lines and all sorts of things to get to there. Well, when I was campaigning, I did about 10,000 miles just driving throughout the district. I believe it. It was it's that big. It's got to be difficult to campaign in a district that that's so far flung because of different media in those areas. Yeah, but I was, you know, being on St. Pete City Council for eight years didn't make it that hard. I was probably the only uh, candidate in my race that had a ballot name recognition in 65% of the House seat. Because really? I had ran, yes, I had ran so far. So the people knew me, and I always tell them, every, and all you do, Google, you know, www.google.com, <laughs> and, you know, don't believe these politicians, leave your lion eyes, and you'll see who's been fighting and advocating for you, and that, that done, done well for me. How long have you been now in the House? I've been in the House. This is my second session. I'm a freshman, uh, part of the largest fresh, the second largest freshman class in the history of the legislature. It was 46 of us. What? Now you said you were on the City Council in, right. in St. Petersburg. What made you decide to join one of the most despised classes of people in the world, politician? Oh wow. Um, well, it's a pleasure to serve. I, I enjoy my job. I enjoy helping people. But coming from a large family of, of eight, you know, with a single divorced mom raising eight kids uh, in, in the ghetto, which is behind the hood, people normally get it mixed up when they talk about the hood. <laughs> I tell them the hood has air conditioning, windows and all, nice houses. The ghetto Not has so much in box, the ghetto. box fans, wood frame houses, dirt front yard, dirt backyard. But coming up from those means, we always that's, looked out That's the neighborhood I lived in to Detroit, by the way. <laughs> We, look, we looked out for our neighbors, so it was always an a, a inkling in, in me to serve. The political side of it, uh, after doing uh, 18 years with Xerox Corporation, working for them for 18 years, I got involved with the, uh, the Neighborhood Association because the block I lived on and was raising four kids had not one, not two, but three crack houses on it. Oh, no. Right. And then when we go to the neighborhood meetings, uh, the neighborhood president would tell you, well, I tell people don't drive down 4th Avenue, which is a good plan. Except I was raising a family on 4th Avenue <laughs> and I own a home on 4th Avenue. And it wasn't a mobile home, so I couldn't pick it up and move it to another area that was drug free. So I had two options, and it was just do something or do nothing. And the other one really wasn't an option. So what happens more times than not, you go to these homeowner association meetings and you stand up and you're vocal and you become president. <laughs> say, you understand that yes I've been there done that right but I never was sucked into politics <laughs> well that was that was uh, I, I, I guess the prelude and you have to understand something about politics politics is a process it's a process that determines whom gets what where when and how much so everything we do in life is politic and I can tell you I hate it but it's a necessary evil you know I, mm -hmm. I joke about it I yes. really do mm -hmm. but I I envy those people who do care enough yes to give up, and you do, you give up just about everything. Yes. You can't go out for dinner, you can't take your kids to the park, there's nothing you can do that somebody's not gonna walk up to you and say, you know, I just want a minute of your time. Well, it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, I love my wife, not so much, but I, I love it. I remember when we first got elected to St. Pete City Council, we went into uh, Wally World, which is Walmart, my, my favorite place. That's where all my constituents are. I go into Walmart and we walk in about three o'clock on a Saturday and um, my wife and I, we all giddy, just having a good time and up and down every hour, people are stopping us saying, I don't mean to bother you, but let me ask you something. <laughs> and my wife's standing there, she's a good trooper, just smiling and I'm handing out cards, trying to talk to people up and down every hour and trying to shop. 
And we left that Walmart about 7 o'clock at night. It's four hours we're in the store. And we get in the car, and my wife, she's a good trooper. She smiles, and she closes the door. She says, I'm never going to the store. <laughs> so now we pull up in front of Wally World. She will not get out. She won't get out. So she says, no, because if I get out, you'll stay forever. So you go in, I'll be waiting for you out here. So, but, I, but I told Read her. Read the book, I, huh? Well, I told her, I said, these, these, the people, they, they, it, it's local governors with a rubber meets the road. And the people have concerns. They're going to see you in churches. As you stated, they're going to see you in the grocery stores. They're going to see you in the mall, around the neighborhood, and in the community. So we're the closest people to the, uh, to the constituency, and they have concerns. So, and, and obviously, some of them, I mean, more times than not, are not going to come to your door. They're not going to go to your office, but they know who you are. So when they see you, they're hopeful that you will you know, lend an ear to try to give them a solution. To Supposedly, your job is part-time. Yes, it is. Supposedly. The pay is part-time. Yeah. Well, I tell everybody it's part-time this, part-time that, <laughs> part-time this, you know. But um, we, we uh, have two offices. We cover um, um, downtown St. Pete. We have an office, and we also have an office in... Uh, Manatee County, because uh, we cover that part of the area also. I have three staff. I have uh, Charles uh, Martin III is my uh, district secretary for Manatee County, Manatee Hillsboro, um, Manatee Hillsboro, Sarasota. Uh, and then uh, Grace um, Mosley uh, Martinez is my uh, district secretary in St. Pete. And I also have a legislative assistant who travels with me back and forth to Tallahassee in a lot of my events. And his name is Cyrus Calhoun III. So we have three staff that help handle it. Because it's a population of 151,000 constituents. So. That's a lot of That's people, lot of people. four people to handle. Yeah. For, well, council only had 30,000. But it, went from, <laughs> it, it blew up overnight. But, I mean, like I said, it's a pleasure to serve and be able to help people out. This is a part-time job, and the, and the income is part-time from Most it. Most definitely part-time. Although, although a lot of people <laughs> live on that income every yeah. year. But you've got a lot of expenses and things that go along with it. What what do you do in the real world to support your family and yourself? I married a really really rich woman. No, I'm just kidding. That was no. a smart thing. <laughs> well, we um, uh, every uh, young man ought to get that piece of advice. Yeah. Well, my day job I own a photography studio. Oh, really? Yeah. What, what's the name of the studio? Newton's Photography Studio. Okay. Yeah. And we've been doing photography a long name time. Named after Newt Newton or name after after myself. <laughs> after Newton. Years old. Yeah. But we've been doing photography for a long time. I mean, I started out doing Polaroids and even shooting on the 110 camera. So we've been doing it a long time. And um, it enabled me, because I believe to do the job right, you have to be self-employed or um, retired. Because it's very demanding of your time. I mean, today, we're in the middle of the day. We want to interview in the middle of the day to be able to come and communicate with you and talk to constituency. Normally, you can't say, hey, boss, can I get like, the <laughs> afternoon off and go over and do an interview? doesn't work that way. So that's just my opinion. It's kind of refreshing to have somebody from the legislature here with me that's not a lawyer. <laughs> Lawyers are good. My wife reminds me of it constantly. She just she wears her shirt around and says, you know, my lawyer can beat your lawyer. <laughs> and and uh, she knows my lawyer's in jail, so, you know. <laughs> no, but um, it's, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a mixture. I would say it's the majority attorneys, but it's a lot of people there that come from Average people that, that, that served in their communities, served on their county commissions, served in their, uh, their city councils, and, and they just care about their communities. So they have some good ideas also. It's not all lawyers, but it's quite a few of them. Let's talk about local politics. Yes. And they say all politics is local, yes. sooner or later. What can we do, especially, my, my big cause celebrate is kids, kids and veterans. Right. And I happen to be a veteran, and they say, I'm not coming out of my childhood yet, or I'm going into my second one. So maybe both. Right. But, but what can we do, especially with kids? What can the legislature do to help these? I watched where we've cut down the Medicaid funding, and kids, one of the legislature people who was sitting right here where you are, right. told me probably eight, nine years ago that in foster care, the kids coming out of it by the time they reach 18 are going to have been sexually abused or have a police record. Yes. And that's scary because well, those kids are the ones we're going to have to deal with as adults. Well, the children are our future. And if we don't invest in them early, we will pay, the, we will pay eventually. I mean, it costs more to uh, keep a kid locked up and confined than it does to put them to a four-year university. Yeah. Yes. And I, for the life of me, I don't understand why. If you look at the funding, I always say, show me your budget 
and I show you your values, the majority of the funding on the front end is to prepare to lock them up. <laughs> it is. I Betty mean, Reed try, and I talked to, about that a yeah, lot. I, to get, she's one of my heroes, by the way. I, yeah. I just love Betty. Yeah, they got they got more money, uh, I guess, set aside for juvenile jail beds than they have for college scholarships and funding for kids to go to school. And I never understand it because juveniles are 11 to 17. So if you're a Christian and you believe in the Bible, the Bible says, you know, train up a child. It didn't say a black child. It didn't say a white child. It didn't say your child or my child. But train up a child in the way he should go. When he's older, he won't falter from it. But we are locking up the child, <laughs> which, is, which is a problem in itself because those chickens, too, will come on the roost. A lot of the problems that you see that are systemic in a lot of the areas that I represent that are socioeconomically disadvantaged areas is because of lack of opportunity for the least of these and most of the young people, mostly black males who look like me. How do we change that? You change it by funding. You change it by funding, giving them opportunity. Myself. Uh, funding what? Funding uh, well, I, I job. Hear people talk about throwing right, money at right. things. Not I understand money funding. you need I, to I can, have, I can tell but you. what would be the concrete steps that you, let's say that I was able to write you a check for $100 million. Right. What would be your concrete steps for getting kids to stay in school instead right. of just hanging out on a street corner? My concrete step, and I know what worked and what got me sitting where I'm at, would be okay. funding, fully funding, after school job and summer jobs. Okay, like we used to have. Correct. I mean, like I said, you looking at a person that uh, I'm a product of it. My mom, a single divorced mom, raised eight kids of government subsidies. You know, food stamps, welfare, government cheese, free lunch, reduced lunch, summer jobs, out school jobs. You're looking at it. But everything I'm not made me everything that I am. And I took full advantage of every opportunity to help realize my full potential because those programs were a hand up, not a hand out. So now that I've broken those chains, my kids can't receive those programs. So they do work. Because, but for those programs, I wouldn't be sitting here. Because if you look at the stats, single divorced female raising eight kids out of government subsidies in the ghetto, uh, I'm supposed to be 70%. dead. I'm supposed to be dead or in jail, not sitting here doing this. And like I say, but for those opportunities. And right now, those opportunities are few and far between. In the city of St. Pete, I spent eight years on the city council. And I talk about this often. We have. A thousand kids, juveniles, they want to work. They don't want to steal cars. They don't want to sell crack. They don't want to break in house. They don't want to break the law. They're in school and they want to work. However, the funding for jobs is for 160 kids. 160? 160. So the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Then between June 1st and August 31st, we arrest between six to 800 juveniles. Six to 800. Remember, you got a thousand want to work. You have money for jobs for 160 of them. But between June 1st and August 31st, we arrest between six to 800. The last year I was on council, I think it was 775. Okay, those 775 need not apply for the 40 after school jobs that I have, which is a joke, because we arrest between 150 to 200 kids a month in, in St. Petersburg. So the 40 jobs are a joke, but the kids now that got the 775 that got records, you can't apply, because now you got a background. And this goes around and around and around. And what's so damning, you know, the last year I was on council, I just found out that, you know, I fought and got funding in the budget for our styles program through the Urban League and to increase the number of our after school jobs. Because that was that's the, that's the real winner. And I'll tell you why in a second. But the after school jobs was supposed to go from 40 to 140. And they're still at 40 to this day. So the money council it never and the mayor never put the money where it's supposed to go. And because of that, we locked up a lot more kids that ruined their lives. And how much does it cost to lock them up? A lot. How I much does it cost average, just to arrest and process I, 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 I can show you arrest and process. The process <laughs> of a juvenile is about $86, <laughs> okay? And if you add in the cost of an officer getting out of the field, driving them out to the Pinellas County Jail for Children, I know they call it a detention center, but it's a jail. If you look at Webster, it is. Webster say if you if I take you, control your movement, lock you up, take your fingerprints, and put you in a cage, that's the jail. That's not me. That's Webster. So when they take them out to the Pinellas County Jail for Children, it's eighty six dollars to process them. The cost is around one twenty five round trip for an officer to be out of the field to transfer them out there. So you take this about two hundred eleven dollars, right? Times um, I think one year we arrested. Uh, the last year was 1,970 juveniles that year. That's almost a half a million dollars we spend just locking them up, giving them permanent records, not opportunities. 
So again, show me your budget, I'll show you your values. The money is put in there, but the more damning part to what we do is, we have the best trained, best equipped, best qualified police force. When I got on council in, in, in 2008, the budget was $83 million. When I left in 16, the budget was $93 million. Through a recession, down through the valley and up on the other side. Now the budget, I think, is north of $104 million. I said that to say this. Our police department spend 30 to 40% of their time from the communication center down arresting juveniles. That is not a conducive use of a $104 million asset. It's cheaper to provide them opportunities. It is. And I'll show you how this works. When I arrived at Northeast High School uh, when I was uh, 15, I think it was 15 now, 16 years old, um, was getting into trouble, you know, cutting class, running around with the bad kids, making F's and D's and all that. So one of the uh, advisors yanked my coattail. He said, Newton, if you stop running around with these bad guys <laughs> and, and get better grades, we can get you a job. And I wanted to work. I wanted to be able to have some money because sure. everything costs money. Everything costs money. Everything costs money. We live in a commercial world. True. The Jordans, the, the iPhone 10s, the, the, the PlayStation 12s or whatever, all that costs money. If you got a girlfriend, she want to eat, she want to be wine and dine, <laughs> that costs money. Everything costs money. Girls are expensive. Girls are very expensive. But, uh, so we, we look at, uh, not you, honey, just the girls. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we look at um, a situation where it's, it's, most of the kids run afoul in the pursuit of money. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? It's not, they don't need drug money. They, they just need some money. And the way they got me was they said, uh, well, Newton, you, if you stop doing that, we can get you a job. So I stopped running around with the bad guys. I took my F's and D's and took them to C's and B's, and they got me a job. And my first check, I'll never forget it, was $40.85. Had my name on it, you know, um, uh, my address. It was like a sense of accomplishment, yes. sense of purpose. And, but it was mine. There wasn't no popo chasing me or none of that. It was mine. <laughs> right. And if I went to my mom and asked her, could I go to the gay blade skating rink or go to the movies, the answer was always yes. You know, so I was motivated. I was encouraged to, to do more and try to, to be more. Exactly. And just that little bit of money, $40.85. You ask me how much it cost. I think I can just show you it was $87 to process them. But that's for um, three hours of work after school for two weeks, I think it was. It was four right. hours I got 50 cents an hour in a job I was done, but I'm a lot older than <laughs> Right. That. But anyway, what happened was when, you, when, when I kept working and they kept tricking me with this, this small check and I kept working, they kept tricking me, I kept working, they kept tricking me, and I, I messed around and graduated. And look at me now. So An I, asset I, to society. I, I, I know it works. And, and you have got to look at what, what the benefits are because while I'm working, the police ain't got to deal with me. You know, and, and if you see four kids in a store without money, they're not shoppers. They're not shoppers, they're shoplifters. <laughs> right. So yeah. you have to be able to provide an opportunity. A lot of people will tell you, you know, Newton, no, no, I'm living proof. And but like I say, but for that after school job and that summer job, I would not be here. I, I would still be doing the menace, the menace things that I was doing. And I can tell you that the the, 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 the crew I ran with, some of them graduated, to, they were robbing and stealing, some of them graduated to killing. And a lot of them are dead. Some of them are hung out on crack. And a lot of them are in prison now. My, so I my, always my three best friends in, in coming up in the in the eighth to ninth grade. Right. One of them died in a bank holdup. One yeah. of them died of an overdose. And the other died doing life in Jackson. Yeah. So I, I I fully understand what you said. And fortunately, my family was able to move me from that area right. to another area. But it's important, I think, that we look at these programs and we make sure the money gets to the kids. That's what's most important. I mean, So much of yeah. this money, uh, you know, the shovel ready that, that right. President Obama came up with, it wasn't shovel ready. Well, a dollar out of every 10 actually got to the worker. The rest right. of it was stuck to the hands of the people taking it down. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in a battle with that right now as I go throughout my district. You have... Um, what I call poverty pimps, because they're getting money off of the poverty. Exactly. You get community development block grant money because of the color of our skins and, and the housing need and the poverty that we have. We have an area in St. Pete that's the most impoverished area in the whole, all of Pocanellas County of a million people. And it's called Midtown, where I was born and raised and my mom died. And I could have saved them a lot of money on a study because I knew it was poverty. I mean, <laughs> right. when they had a recession, what, what, what was that? Who was already? 
who was already robbing Peter to pay Peter. It, it pay amazes Paul. me how these university professors do all these studies. Right. I mean, they and use the these, students to do it. Right. You can and walk it, down there, pick one kid, and say, "Is there poverty?" <laughs> Are you poor? Yeah, yeah, I'm poor. But they came out with a study that showed it was the most impoverished area in the whole county. And then we subsequently got together and, and formed what they call the community redevelopment area. And that area is like a, a square that it, what, when the money flows into it, a percentage of it, you set a low watermark on the, on the real estate value. So anything above that low watermark is put into account to be used on projects, infrastructure, and uh, um, other projects in that area to help alleviate poverty. Well, the impoverished area got about $465,000, the first round of, of uh, taxing. And that money was immediately spent on people that wasn't in poverty. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, hey, it, I, mean blew, I, I totally understand. It blew me I, away. I it, but you. the rationale of the people that was in charge of it was that, well, we'll help these rich people. And when they fix up their businesses and do more, then there'll be more money for the poor people. Well, that's what this new tax plan in Washington is, but let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah, it's more trickle down, but I, I look at that and I say to myself, I often wonder why here in 2017 that the area where I was born and raised uh, is still in shambles and still impoverished the way it is. And, and now being on the state legislature and seeing from the 30,000 square foot view, I see why. Because if there's no poverty, there's no money. And the people that are, are mostly trying to push these programs up that are not going to help alleviate the poverty are taking those administrative costs that you talked about and living off of them. So they're living off of the poverty. And the people that are in poverty, they'll get some crumbs or they might get some, a few peanuts, but never the factory. Imagine if we took 100% of the community development block grant money and put it toward housing needs, affordable housing needs for the people that needed it, for which the money was allocated for. Imagine if we took 100% of all the money that was generated for tax income and financing to alleviate poverty and actually put it to alleviating poverty. Imagine what we can do. Well, just think, if you took a poor neighborhood right. and you took kids and you had them go out and just clean up the neighborhood, right. you're going to have a net plus in a neighborhood that's not poor, very close to your district in Apollo Beach. Right. There's a group of parents that got together and they put a bunch of kids, their kids, into a pool and said, anybody that needs help, these kids are willing to do it for you. Right. And you donate what you want, and they pay the kids a little bit. Yeah. Nobody gets any money off it except for the kids. And that's, that's, that's what we did. And, and we the won't... kids learn to work. Right. And, and now I can tell you, all of, no one wakes up and says, I'm going to go steal a car and I'm going to sell some crack. I'm going to rob somebody. No old kid worked up with that. Kid wake up, bright eyed, bright eyed, bushy tail, with dreams, hope, and admiration. But once you take them out to the Pinellas County Jail for Children, I call it criminal university, and they get exposed to that environment, the treatment they get. But the, the, the public defender, Mr. Bernie McKay, said it best. He said they have what they call dead eyes. When yeah. the kids see that, man, it crushed their soul. It crushed their hope and admiration. There's no joy like when I got my first uh, check for after school work. I mean, there's no light in their eyes, you know. But if you flip that around and you got something like a job course center that we have in Pinellas County, that with a $25,000 investment, you can turn around away with a kid. Get him a skilled trade, okay, and then he'll become a taxpayer and a productive citizen of that community. What a noble concept. And that's a hell of a lot cheaper than locking them up and spending money to do that. But like I said, it's got to be a commitment of the politicians to, to, to really want to fund and make a difference. A lot of them is just lip service. Because I'll tell you in a minute, don't watch what I say. Watch what I do. Exactly. And then and they won't do that. They'll say a lot of stuff. Kids are important. Kids are important to get reelected. But after that, we're not going to provide nothing for them. Show me your budget, I'll show you your values. And you look at the amount of kids that we lock up and ruin the opportunities. I mean, on misdemeanor type stuff. And, 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 and once you start down that road, I mean, you know, most of the tragic shootings that you saw, the school shootings and all, were all done by kids. In my opinion, I think kids are the most dangerous. A kid with no hope and admiration is one of the most dangerous things as all. Oh. Because they, they, have, they have no moral compass, they have no value system. When I lived in that neighborhood in Detroit, <laughs> yes. my folks were very, very poor yeah. at the time. We'd come from Canada, moved over here as immigrants, and Dad bought the best house he could and where he was at. And we didn't have anything. Right. And my buddies had nothing. And, you know, if I saw a bicycle over there and I had no hope of ever getting a bicycle, I'd just go ride that one. Right. And I, so I, I really understand yeah. this. 
What I'm looking for is to break that cycle, to right. give these kids actual hope. Right. Well, my, my, mind, my mindset is, you know, I'm, I, I thank you for this interview, and hopefully the people out there will see it, but I want to put the poverty pimps out of business. I want to have the people rise up throughout well, my I'm with you on that. Yeah, I've never heard it said that yeah, way, but I agree. I do. I, do. I, want, I want the people to rise up and demand, not ask demand, because um, power only concedes to demands. That's all the thing power ever conceded to. So I want them to demand that the funding that are, is coming there for those purposes, 100% be used for those purposes. You often hear my colleagues talk about the Sadowski uh, Trust Fund uh, up in Tallahassee for affordable housing. Shouldn't raid the fund, should put more money toward it. They're right. But the same ones hollering fully funded the Sadowski Trust Fund, the same local politicians that are saying put more money and use that money for intended purposes, they got funds right here in their town that they won't use 100% of. You know what I'm saying? So that makes them a hypocrite by definition. Representative Newton, I promise to give you a, <laughs> at least one to two minutes to talk directly to your yes. constituents. And you've done that all the way. And yes. I'm so proud of you. I think you've done a great job. Yes. But let's take that one or two minutes just to talk directly to them about your hopes, dreams, and <laughs> what you'd like to see. And maybe thank, thank the ones that put you in office right. and tell the other ones you're still going to work for them. Right. Well, I'm, I'm representing Wingate Newton. Newton. I um, serve District 70. I serve on the pre-K through 12 uh, appropriations. I serve on the Health Quality Committee. I serve on transportation infrastructure, and I serve on the Joint Committee for Collective Bargaining. And I think I missed one. <laughs> Let me see: pre-K, health quality, transportation infrastructure, uh, and um, the Joint Committee for uh, Collective Bargaining. In my first session, we were able to pass a bill for affordable housing. Me and myself, well, me and Senator Brandis was able to pass a bill for um, affordable housing task force. We brought by $365,000 for happy workers in, in St. Pete Early Learning Center, over a million dollars for uh, Mount Zion Early Learning Pilot Program. We brought back a million five for a water project in Rebonia. We also brought back uh, over 207000 for the Sarasota YMCA SWIM project. It is my goal to advocate for people throughout this entire district. And I want to uh, hear from you. I mean, you can reach me at 727-893-246, I'm sorry, 892-2468. You can also contact my staff in Manatee or Sarasota. If you have events that you think are of importance, contact me. If I can't go, we have three staff that can attend. So you can share your, inform your information with them because they have access to me. I'm here to serve the constituency uh, in, the, in that district. Um, I did very well in my election. I won 75% of the vote, or 76% of the vote. But for the 24% of the people who didn't vote for me, I'm here to serve you too. I, I enjoy what I do. I've been at this, this will be my 10th year in my second session. It's a pleasure to serve. And if I can help or do anything, reach out to me and let me know. Well, if you're working on this with children, you're doing a very good job. Yes. That's, that's so important, to get these neighborhoods cleaned up, right. get them safe. I mean, I remember up in Dayton, Ohio, which is not one of the hotbeds of bad things happening. It's a fairly good right. Midwestern city. Kids coming into the club and talking about having to sleep under the bed rather than on top of it right. because being shot at in their neighborhoods. And kids just don't grow up well that way. It's a problem. And people like yourself who live the problem, right. who lived in the neighborhood, Living are the best ones to give us solutions for those things. And I really appreciate your coming on the show. Yes, and by the way, uh, while you're up in the legislature, the show could use a little bit of money. The station could. So any help you can give us on <laughs> budgeting, we certainly appreciate well, that. We, we look forward to being supportive. You need more public access. I mean, I'm not knocking the mainstream media, but you need to get the word out. The people need to know. Hosea 4.5 says, my people are destroyed. Destroyed because they like knowledge. So knowledge is the key. Knowledge is power. It, it's so important. And this show, as you've well watched, we're not in the business of arguing with people and trying to decide whether or not what they are saying is true or not true. We believe you're smart enough to sit and listen to people and decide for yourself whether or not what a man is saying makes sense. And for me, that's an important facet. Correct. Commercial TV's got to pay the bills. That's their purpose. We've got to pay the bills. We've got to look for someone to help us on it. Right. So I really appreciate your being here. Yes, sir. 
I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. Representative Newton, thank you for being with thank us. You for having me, sir. Really appreciate that. You're unique, you're special, you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. And we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. And again, Representative, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me.